Good morning and welcome to Korea Today, live from Seoul. A preliminary heavy snow warning has been issued in the central and eastern regions of Korea for the first time this season. With temperatures dipping below zero, commuters are in for a slippery ride. And what will happen to Chang Song Tae and what is he being called by North Koreans? I'll tell you more in the headlines. And yesterday was the final day of the National Assembly's regular session. We'll tell you how many bills were passed on in print. Korea's eastern coast is suffering from low catch in squids, one of their most famous product, regional products. What is the reason behind declining number of squids and can there be effective measures? I have coming up more. Top musicians from the three nations of the East come together for an ensemble that bridges cultures. The Korea-China-Japan Cultural Exchange Concert, East Side Story. Im Yun Hee has more. And visit the old Seoul, where some 400 years of history live on. From an ancient shrine to a flea market that has it all, we take you to Dongmyo to see some unique attraction. On Wednesday, December 11, 2013. From Arirang News, this is Korea Today. And good to have you with us on Korea Today on this Wednesday morning. So we're expecting some heavy snow this morning. Not just expecting, we're actually getting some in parts of Gangwon Do as well as uh, Chungcheong Buk Do. So we'll now go over to Idami for more and a detailed look at what we're expecting today, especially because it is commuting time. Tommy, good morning. And good morning. how does it look out how there? How bad is it out there? Good morning, everyone. Today I am reporting live from Chungnogu, Seoul. I'm at Gwangamun Square, and just about a minute or two minutes ago, there was some heavy snow that was falling this morning. Right now, uh, conditions have cleared up just a bit, but I can see the snow around me. It has piled up just a bit. Here in Seoul, we're expecting about five centimeters. Currently, there are heavy snow warnings over in Gyeonggi-do, also Gangwon-do, Chungcheongbuk-do, and Chungcheongnam-do. All I can say is with the freezing temperatures, right now it is zero degrees, uh, the snow will start to turn into icy patches. The roads will be quite slippery. Um, make sure to get a head start to your morning commutes. I will give you more updates in the latter half of the show, so stay tuned. Those of you who are just tuning in, a heavy snowfall warning has been issued in some parts of Korea. Mm -hmm. So your way to work, your commute to work will likely be pretty messy. That's right, that's right. So maybe um, take off a little bit earlier or uh, refer to uh, or take uh, public transportation, that's which is right. usually the better way to go. All right, we'll turn to Nayang Gyeong for a check of the headlines we're following at this hour. He is a human scum, or I want him to burn to death in a furnace. These are just some of the sentiments expressed by North Koreans about former second-in-command Chang Song Tech, according to Pyongyang's ruling Workers' Party's daily Nodong Shimun. So what will happen to him now? A South Korean Unification Ministry official says given the severity of his charges, Chang is expected to at least be sent to a political prison camp. Analysts are also not ruling out the possibility of him facing public execution. But one thing for sure is that the people of North Korea, at least on the surface, are furious. Who do they think they are to refuse the Supreme Commander's order? As a citizen of the People's Republic, this cannot be happening. Who is Chang Song Tech? Wasn't he the one who was beloved the most by our dear leaders? Then how can he betray the faith, loyalty and the least amount of conscience one should have as a human being? Meanwhile, regarding rumors of Chang's aides seeking asylum, South Korea's Unification Minister Ryu gil says he is not aware or has not been told of any specific cases. The ruling Henry Party has officially demanded two lawmakers from the opposition Democratic Party be expelled for making controversial statements. The ruling party filed a motion at the National Assembly's Disciplinary Committee Tuesday signed by all of its 155 lawmakers. The two DP legislators in question are Chang Hana and Yang Seung Jo. Chang has been criticized by the Henry Party for officially denying the results of last year's presidential race and 
calling on President Park to resign. Yang has been condemned for saying the president will face the same fate as her father, who was assassinated if she does not listen to the public's warnings. And President Park, for the first time, spoke about the controversy at Tuesday's cabinet meeting. She said statements that go over the line only worsen political strife and help neither the people nor the country. On top of the more than 4,000 railway union workers who have been stripped of their posts, another 1,600 have been removed from their positions for continuing a strike. But unionized workers are still continuing to protest against the Korea Railway's approval of plans to set up a subsidiary to be in charge of operating new KTX routes leaving from southern Seoul. The workers claim this will eventually lead to the privatization of the the state-run corporation, resulting in mass layoffs and fair hikes. But the government and the company say their claims are groundless as private investors will never be allowed to buy stakes in it. Cool Rail adds KTX lines as well as Seoul subway lines will be running normally to minimize public inconvenience. The amount of debt owed by Korea's public institutions as of the end of last year is set to hover around 566 trillion won or roughly 540 billion U.S. dollars. That's a hundred fourteen billion dollars more than the national debt and almost double the amount from 2008. The Korea Institute of Public Finance has advised the government to review and revise major projects that were initiated by the former Lee myung Bak administration, saying the amount of debt increased exponentially between 2007 and 2012. Finance Minister Hyun Woo Suk says those responsible will be held accountable. The role and efforts of the heads of public organizations will be thoroughly evaluated. Those who didn't do so well will be held accountable regardless of their terms. Experts say there needs to be stringent measures to prevent the debt from snowballing any further, especially as the fiscal conditions of 9 out of 12 major public institutions were found to be quote-unquote virtually insolvent. And good morning, everyone. It's time now to take a look at your newspaper headlines. Not a lot of love for the country's lawmakers on the front pages this morning as the National Assembly wrapped their final day of its regular session yesterday. Tonga Irbo's headline reads, Undeserving National Assembly crams on last day of regular session. And the subheadlines call this Parliament Cheak, or the worst, as it wasted 99 of the 100 days of this session. It pushed through some 30 34 bills yesterday, including real estate and local tax bills. The first day, the article says that bills were passed into law. That's just 0.5 percent of the 6,320 bills that had been lining up for review. Parliament will continue discussions now in an extraordinary session among its tasks, as of course, to review budgetary bills that it aims to get through by January 3rd. Meanwhile, the memorial service for Nelson Mandela makes its presence on pretty Pretty much all of our papers this morning. The image title reads Nelson Mandela Memorial brings world together and what you're seeing there is a shot of the 95,000 seater FNB Stadium in Johannesburg. Despite the rain, people gathered to give tribute to the former South African President Nelson Mandela and celebrate his life. A teacher, a racial healer, the man who changed mankind. Just a few of the ways he was remembered. Scooting over to our next paper now, Chungang Ilbo's main headline also highlights the political divide that has frozen the nation's parliament. The headline reads, Presidential Race Controversy Diversion One Year and Counting. Missing are the people's interests. Now, in light of the recent inflammatory comments by a couple of Democratic Party lawmakers aimed at President Park Geun-hye, the sub-headline notes that rival parties are still pointing the finger at each other and the past. The ruling Senuri Party calling the comments a trick to gain support by reviving pro Hyun sentiments, while the DP shot back, saying its rival party did all it could to invalidate the Hyun administration. Meanwhile, the 
image, as you can see, Mandela's memorial service also on Chungang Ilbo's front page, as it is on our next paper, Joseon Ilbo. We'll go ahead and take a look at its front page there. Joseon Ilbo's accompanying headline reads, Leaders of Adversarial Nations Hold Hands Before Mandela. And what you're seeing there is a handshake between U.S. President Barack Obama and Cuba's leader, Raul Castro, the first time leaders of the two opposing nations have met in a public setting, setting, the caption says. Talk about the power of symbolism there. They were uh, among some 100 former and current world leaders to attend the memorial that could go down as the largest in recent memory. And Kyungyang Shimun also has a related image with the title, Giant of History, Mandela Lives On. Uh, we'll go ahead and return, though, to issues here in Korea with Made Business Newspaper's front page. Uh, it has a foreboding story uh, headline reading, Korea dragged into four lows. Those lows all beginning with the character cha, meaning low. That's low growth, low inflation, low birth rate, and low employment. It cites a report by the Hyundai Research Institute on the requisites for Korea's entry into advanced nations, which found that the Korean economy has shown similar signs to that of Japan's triggering concern that it too could be on course for what was characterized for Japan as its last two decades. And with that, we'll wrap your look at what's in print on this Wednesday. Next up are your closing numbers from Tuesday's Market Action. It's the prime season for squids in Korea, but on the East Coast, the volume of squids caught has been dwindling, hurting the businesses of local fishermen there. And I, Kim, Chen, Kim Chanju has covered this story. Good morning, Chanju. Good morning. As you just mentioned, Minjang winter is the season for catching um, squids in the eastern coast, but local fishermen are concerned about dropping numbers of fish uh, to squids caught uh, for the last few years. They say that uh, Chinese fishing boats on North Korean waters may be the main reason behind it. So I went out to the eastern coast myself to find out more. Gangwondo's eastern coast is known for its abundance of seafood. It's supposed to be busy now since it's the last leg of squid catching season. But these days, fishermen say they're more anxious than busy. The number of squids caught on the East Coast has dropped significantly compared to the average year. There were only two fishing boats that went out to catch squid today. Since the amount of fish caught during this period makes up for most of the fishermen's annual income, their concerns are mounting by the day. The amount of fish caught here in Sokcho has significantly dropped. Normally 60 squid fishing boats would operate here, but now only 20 of them are up and running. It's a huge blow to our fishing operation. The squid supply is completely running dry. We have stopped working for almost a month. Since fishermen here are not able to catch many squids, it is affecting Sokcho's local economy. So why are there less squid being caught? There are multiple reasons such as the water temperature and the surrounding weather. But local fishermen point out the Chinese trawlers that operate around North Korean waters as the main cause. Chinese fishing boats are sweeping up our stocks. It's only 80 to 100 kilometers from here to Japan, and about 500 Chinese fishing trawlers are wiping out fish when they pass by. Usually, Chinese fishing trawlers come in hundreds or thousands at a time. For us fishermen, there's not much we can do. A 2004 agreement between China and North Korea allowed Chinese trawlers to fish in North Korean waters for a certain annual fee but there is a problem with the way they catch fish. 
Korea's squid jigging uses lights to gather fish and catch them. However, Chinese fishing trawlers sweep away all the squids underneath the ocean using trawl nets. So it is 20 to 30 times more difficult for us to catch fish. The way they catch fish is affecting not only various marine species, but also the food chain and destroying the ecosystem. In order to protect marine species, Korean fishing boats are limited to catching squid using jigs, while Chinese fishing boats sweep away fish with trawl nets. There has been a decline in the annual catch each year. It was over 20,000 tons before the 2004 agreement between China and North Korea. But the total number of fish caught in 2013 is only at about half that amount. The numbers jumped significantly in 2009 when Chinese fishing boats temporarily stopped operation due to renegotiations with North Korea on the fishing deal. Recently, China is seeing a growing demand for squid, and that's why more and more Chinese fishing boats are flocking to these waters. There are about 1,000 to 1,200 Chinese fishing boats operating in North Korean waters. Also, about 120 Chinese fishing boats were docked on Urungdo Island due to bad weather conditions. Since 1,200 Chinese fishing trawlers are spread over Korea's eastern coast, there's no way to solve this problem. It's not the first time Korea has experienced trouble with Chinese trawlers. Korea's coast guards can crack down on boats that cross into South Korea's waters and fish illegally, but there are no specific measures as of yet that can be implemented when it comes to boats in North Korean waters. We have been conducting joint crackdowns with uh, coast guards, uh, district and government offices to further prevent damages for Korean fishing boats. For a smooth crackdown, Chinese speakers are assigned to medium-sized vessels and fishing boat captains are told to immediately report illegal Chinese fishing boats on our coastal areas. There has also been an increasing number of Chinese fishing boats taking shelter from bad weather in the East Sea, adding to the worries of Korean fishermen. The continuous conflict between Chinese and Korean fishermen is raising concerns about the livelihood of many in the area, and those affected are in need of a solution to this problem. Now, Chanju, Korea has fishing regulations, especially when it comes to trawling, obviously for ecological reasons and mm -hmm. to protect the fishing industry. Right. How about internationally? Are there international laws on trawling? Well, since the trawling with uh, fishing with trawlers um, obviously destroy um, the population of the fish, uh, China itself actually decided to limit uh, the uh, mesh of net. Um, usually, when fishing boats in in international waters, when they are crossing the waters that they are not allowed to or if they have no fishing uh, rights, it will be regulated under international law. But uh, unfortunately, there has been no specific laws to restrict uh, fishing with trawlers as of yet. Uh, but then the United Nations has been um, warning countries that are running illegal fishing operations in foreign waters to refrain from fishing with trawlers. Mm -hmm. And Chanju, you told me before the show that a similar situation that you talked about in the mm -hmm. report was going on on Russian waters. Tell us more about that. That's right. There are some problems in Russian waters as well. Uh, when Korean fishing boats in Russia, they uh, light up uh, fish lure lights to lure fishes. Um, Chinese boats, fishing boats will come in the way and they wipe out all the fishes underneath the ocean with a trawl net. Uh, now, Korea is paying um, 20 million won that's roughly about 20,000 US dollars to uh, in fishing fee in Russian waters when Chinese uh, fishing boats are operating illegally. Hmm. So it is estimated that there are about 1,000 illegal Chinese fishing boats in Russia right now, and the Russian government is trying to take measures for it, but it is still not enough to regulate them. Hmm. So it sounds like the government's hands are tied when it comes to Chinese vessels operating in right. North Korean waters mm -hmm. as well as in Russia's uh, waters. Now, what are some of the measures that are being considered? Well, um, uh, the biggest problem is uh, Chinese fishing boats in North uh, Korean waters, but uh, as South and North Korea continues its strained relations, the Korean government has not found a solution to this problem as of yet. Um, uh, meanwhile, in Gangwon-do in Eastern Coast, the province itself decided to take some measures, and they're planning to request for support measures from Russia uh, to um, 
to expand uh, fishing areas and aid fishermen indirectly, for example, providing them with um, um, subsidies for oil costs and such. Mm -hmm. So that's so um, provide some financial subsidies. That's right. Okay, I hope it all works out for them. Thank you for following this story, Tanju. Thank, thank you very much, Tanju. All right, uh, the three nations of the East have gotten together for a concert or an event which actually is in line with the term music is the universal language of mm -hmm. mankind. And our very own Im Yun Hee went over to check it out to tell us more. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Yuni. <laughs> Chenju is gone and <laughs> Yuni is here, yes. It's a KT Magic Straight Show. Up. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the musicians are coming from Korea, China, and Japan for a cultural exchange concert. And what's really interesting about this particular performance um, is that it was originally intended to represent the friendship between the three countries. Um, but after recent situations, I talked to the musicians and they expressed that they feel the concert has become a symbol of how music can overcome differences and create very special relationships. So let's take a look. Music doesn't discriminate between cultures. The instrument itself is universal. And music has brought together these artists from three different countries, despite all cultural differences, to play in a classical music chamber concert called East Side Story. It's a story of three countries in the Far East, uh, Korea, China, and Japan. And the purpose of this concert is to promote peace and friendship between these three countries. And uh, we are also celebrating the end of the year. The East Side Story concert marks the Korea Foundation's 22nd year anniversary. And to celebrate, the Foundation has gathered seven accomplished musicians from across seas and across lands to convene in Korea. They've come here to share their love for music and show how it can be used to cross any boundaries. I think there is a very a kind of um, a symbol of being like Asian musicians and approaching to our Western music and we all have the same enthusiasm and we also, you know, still have holding the passion for playing together and uh, being inspired by each other. I think it's just great. This chamber music concert will be comprised of three pieces. First, a light Weber, then a riveting Mendelssohn, and for the finale, an exciting Brahms. The musicians' interpretations of these popular chamber music artists brings an East Side Story flair to the concert, which starts in Seoul. But the tour will then make its way to Tegu and will end in Shenzhen, China. These traveling musicians are eager to perfect their performance, and the hours of rehearsal don't seem to bother them. In fact, they seem to be truly enjoying it, because they're not only sharing their music, but also the company of their neighboring musicians. Wow, I can really feel the enthusiasm and the passion. I mean, they were all smiles, all the players, all the artists. Yes, so you know actually chamber music was created to be um, experienced on a very intimate level and this particular performance uh, was quite cozy. Uh, but did you know that classical musicians also feed off the energy of the audience? Of course, So yes. I was talking to the uh, musicians and one musician in particular, Mr. Shigenori Kudo, was um, telling me that it's like a dialogue between the musician and the audience. So the more the audience puts in, uh, the more the musician can respond. And in fact, he also said that Korea is one of his favorite places to perform because the Korean audience is extremely um, receptive, interactive, and they're extremely enthusiastic about classical music. Okay, so they'll start their tour in Seoul soon, so the million dollar question is when can we see this performance? Yes, as a matter of fact, Young, I think you're really going to appreciate this Me. particular concert because it is being offered for free to the public. Oh, <laughs> oh why is <laughs> Young so you you should perceive Young? <laughs> yes, so I appreciate it too. They I really like want to encourage people to attend the event. Um, but you do have to register for the event, which you can do on their website. Uh, they'll actually be starting their performance tonight in Seoul at the Sejong Performing Arts Center. Then they'll be moving down to Tegu tomorrow to share their message with the southern part of the peninsula. And they'll be finishing off the tour early next week in China, in case 
Okay. You guys are going to be there next week. Okay. If we have any Shen plans, Shen. I'm going to China. Well, I think I'm going to miss the uh, China show, but uh, I will try to catch this one. It starts uh, today, right? Yes. Tonight. So and it's also free. So, tomorrow, yeah. she said. Oh. Start tonight. Start tonight. tonight. Mm -hmm. And oh, right. it goes until tomorrow and, and one more day, right? Yes. All right. Well, thank you very thank much, Judy. My pleasure. All right. Well, if you have some plans. Free no? right. concert. Why not? <laughs> How can you say no, right? Well, still ahead on Korea today, we will be talking about some items to keep you warm during the winter. This mercury or the merc mercury this winter is expected to hit record lows. But uh, with rising energy costs, many people are seeking products that provide better warmth at better prices. And that's very important these days. We look at unique but cost efficient hot items. For yet another installment on Medical Korea, we've taken you to some world-class general hospitals mm -hmm. around Korea. And today we're going to take you to some specialized medical facilities in okay. Korea that are famous for... Well... Liposuction. Liposuction. Um, I love how you point me out right there. <laughs> oh, I didn't... I, I just, like, was that no, intentional? I, not, no, it wasn't... By no means. <laughs> no, but the fact is that, you know, everyone has those troubled areas. If you've ever been on a diet, it's some of those areas like the love handles and, and that little fat amount of fat right under, under your tummy or behind the back of your arms. And these are really hard to get rid of. So some people have actually taken the option of liposuction. So we'll be looking at that as well as people with back pain. You might want to pay attention as well. The Seoul 365MC Hospital is a specialized obesity clinic that has a network of 22 hospitals around Korea that focus solely on liposuction procedures. The entire 15-story building is a specialized liposuction clinic. <laughs> Using a cute blob of fat as its mascot, the obesity clinic is trying hard to change people's prejudices against obesity treatment. Rachel Ann Hewink is considering receiving liposuction. She says she has already heard about this hospital's excellent treatment techniques and effective results. They have a really good English website, and it was the number one obesity clinic in Korea, so I figured they could give me a lot of advice. Through basic consultation, she learns about the procedure in detail. After looking over before and after photos, she can decide whether or not to have surgery. As Korea's liposuction procedures have recently become well known, various patients from around the world visit for this surgery. Liposuction is commonly done around the abdomen, thighs, and upper arms. We receive many patients not only from China, but from the U.S. and Australia as well, because many of them suffer from obesity. We also get a lot of inquiries from Africa and the Middle East. But the surgery doesn't begin right away. First, they check the front, rear, left, and right views of the body through a 3D scanner to precisely measure the size of each part of the body. I think, um, my stomach. Stomach? Yeah. I think, um, stomach fat is the hardest to get rid of. When the patient decides which area they want surgery on, the next step is ultrasound imaging. To increase the precision and safety of the surgical procedure, doctors analyze the amount of body fat, thickness of the fat tissues, and progression of cellulite formations in detail. The procedure takes one to three hours. Because the surgery removes fat tissues from specified body parts, the patient is able to see results within a relatively short period of time. The aftercare center focuses on treatments that prevent the skin from sagging due to the sharp decrease in fat cells. From surgery to discharge, the whole procedure only requires one day. Surgery takes one to three hours, and because we don't administer general anesthesia, 
patients can leave the hospital two hours after surgery. Basically, they receive surgery and leave the hospital the same day. Because the surgical area can be covered with clothes as long as they wear compression garments, they can resume regular daily activities. And this is a different specialized hospital at the Kimpo International Airport. The location itself is very different from other hospitals. It's actually within the airport, which is very convenient for foreign patients. For four years in a row, this institute has been selected as one of the world's best hospitals for medical tourists by the Medical Travel Quality Alliance in the U.S. It's one of Korea's market leaders in medical tourism and the world's largest specialized spine hospital. Patients with various backgrounds from all over the world come here for one reason only, to seek treatment in the spine. Kazantsev Nikolai was here as a guardian to his nephew, but ended up having surgery himself. They have excellent medical skills, and the medical staff provide great service. In Russia, you need to wait two to three months for surgery, but here I was surprised to book surgery the next day. I already like the clear and swift treatment process. Uridir Spine Hospital is already famous in Russia. Friends recommended the hospital to Kazantsev Nikolai, and he recommended it to his nephew. Then the nephew directly arranged an appointment with the hospital through email. As such, many foreign patients are seeking out Uridir Spine Hospital thanks to recommendations and information online. The waiting time is not long and the medical staff explains things in detail. I'm very pleased. In another room, Kabdubchev Tulagen is one hour away from undergoing spine surgery. The doctor's warm care provides the patients with comfort. Korean medical skills are already famous in Kazakhstan, so I received recommendations from friends that have already received treatment in Korea. I chose this hospital because it's a specialized spine hospital and not a general hospital. I also saw a lot of good reviews left by foreign patients. Uridir Spine Hospital became world famous for its minimally invasive spinal surgery technique. By minimizing the incision area, they can preserve as much of the normal disc and muscle tissue as possible. This surgery does require incisions, but we try to minimize the incision by performing the minimally invasive spine surgery technique. The larger the incision there is, the more risk there is for complications due to the damages in muscle and bone. We developed this technique to minimize the incision area. The treatment process differs depending on the severity of the problem but many spine conditions can be improved with the minimally invasive surgery. Especially with the development of the world's first endoscopic laser microdisectomy technique, there's no need for general anesthesia or incisions. Every year, patients from over 60 different countries visit Korea to seek spine treatment at Uridir Spine Hospital. With 30 years of spinal research and knowledge under its belt, and extensive experience in customized foreign patient care, this hospital offers the comfort of home as well as reliable medical services. 
I like the hospital's system and even the rehabilitation staff are friendly and knowledgeable. In Russia, we call people with good hand techniques golden hands, and I think that's exactly what the doctors here are. Through long-term investment and research, Korea's specialized hospitals now boast world-class medical skills. And they are quickly becoming the new leaders in the country's medical tourism industry. You know when hospitals are doing well, when a lot of their patients are visiting by word of mouth, and mm -hmm. one of our staff told me that that's exactly what's happening at the Uridol Spine Hospital. More than 60% of the foreign patients book everything by themselves, oh, wow. not through an agency. Mm. And these specialty hospitals are going abroad. The Uridol Spine Hospital has branched out to cities such as Jakarta, Istanbul, and Dubai. And in the case of the liposuction clinic, it operates branches in Osaka and Tokyo. Tokyo. And uh, these overseas facilities, they have a good networking system where you can expect the same level of expertise and services mm -hmm. at these facilities. Okay, we're used to seeing general hospitals with certain, um, certain uh, departments that are dedicated to a certain field, but now these are just hospitals that are dedicated to a certain field. If you want more information about these hospitals that we saw today, you can visit the 365MC Hospital website and you can find information on the, on the various um, services that they provide the medical services that they have, as well as a site for an English consultation hotline. And you can also visit the Uri Der Spine Hospital webpage and find out more information about that as well. Um, they also um, offer consultations via telephone as well as a video chatting service huh. so people from overseas can actually consult. Okay. A lot of services, Good. right? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to check out the liposuction <laughs> page. <laughs> All right, still ahead on Korea today on our Seoul segment, we're going to take you to Cho Dongmyo. That's an ancient shrine that carries 400 years of past traces, and surrounding it is a flea market where you can get some of the best bargains. It's a neighborhood where the history and culture of Seoul continues to live on. So stay tuned for that story. The Korean Meteorological Administration forecasts that uh, it will get very cold, some of the coldest winters that we've had starting from mid-December to January, and heavy snow is expected as well. Angela Park joins us with a few items that may help keep you warm. Good morning. Good morning. I think a lot of these companies heard uh, your reports or the uh, KMA's reports about how cold it's expected to be. Mm -hmm. Thus, we're seeing a lot of new products coming out that are more eco-friendly and more efficient when it comes to heating you and your home up. Uh -huh. So we're going to take a look at some of these items. If you're ready, let's start with this one right here, actually. Uh, this is called the RT. Now, um, this is the basic form, but if you notice, it can be quite aesthetically pleasing as well okay. if you hang it up on your wall. And it's a multifunctional heater. So before I show you it working in action, I'm going to show you the parts behind it. Because how this works, if I break it apart, I'm going to lift it up here. Um, the thing about heaters is that most heaters, they use propellers, like a fan system. Okay. But this, it uses a cross pen, what's called a cross pen, and this is that exact right here. Now, what it does, it sucks in the air this way into the cross pen, emits it out into the PTC is what we're calling it, and that's a heating system. Heats up the air and then shoots it out this way. All right, so now we saw the internal yes. structure of it. Let's uh, see how it works. Good idea. I have the remote. Oh, it turned on already. And so, as you can see, the cellophane moving, it's yeah. heating up. Now, a lot of people are worried, though, about heating devices. We see accidents, fires, etc. Et cetera, that's right? right, that's right. There are some main safety functions that come with the RT. So for example, it doesn't go higher than 60 degrees. Now, the second it reaches above 60, it shuts off automatically. Mm -hmm. Also, let's say we were to drop this. I'm going to try to hit it really hard. Oh. The alarm starts ringing and then it shuts off as well. Now, another thing is if it were to be on for longer than six hours, mm -hmm. then it also shuts off automatically. Okay, it looks like it's got all the safety aspects covered, but what about uh, energy consumption-wise? How is Good it? Good question. It only uses about 500 watts of electricity, so it's not going to be, you know, making you bend over backwards with your electricity bills. Okay, well, sounds good. All right, that's all right. Uh, one personal type of heater. I don't think you could heat up a whole studio like this with that, but... Not our studio, anyway. It seems like <laughs> small spaces that'll do wonders. Okay, now, what's our next item? Our next item, I think it might actually confuse 
confuse you a little bit. I'm gonna cross right over here. Feel this, Young. It's um, a flexible type of material. Okay. Now we call this the rolling stove. Have you ever heard of that? No, I've never heard of a rolling stove. I don't even know how this actually works. Well, I don't blame you for never having heard of it because it's not only the first of its kind in Korea, it's the first of its kind in the world. So as I stick it in there and put this uh, top part onto it, I can turn it on, mm -hmm. right? And I turn the switch, and then I turn the power on, and it's gonna start heating up. Now this fabric, it's electricity conductible material made from carbon. They added urethane into it to make it more flexible. Now it's gonna start heating up really quickly, Young, so I advise you not to touch it. As let's, it starts to heat up, yeah, you wanna measure it? Yeah, let's um, see it firsthand. Okay, first uh, we'll just get the back of the studio oh lighting there. It's 21 degrees, as you can see, <gasps> and uh, it's warming up. Mm -hmm. You can see that uh, it's at 40 degrees and climbing up, 41, 42. It heats up very quickly. Very quickly. So if you're at, at a work um, office space, then you can just have this right next to you and uh, you'll have no problem staying warm exactly. in the office. Of course, you know, a lot of offices in Korea these days, they're um, cutting down on power usage. So. This only uses about 40 to 50% of electricity versus electrical heater systems or stoves as we call it here in Korea. So it's very energy efficient as well. I'm gonna turn that off because we're gonna burn ourselves on there. Okay, another thing is that it accommodates different sizes. Yes. These panels, you can get a bigger panel and then replace it and switch it along as you go. Absolutely. Okay. Third item, you might really like this one, Young, actually. This is called the E, or the Tazhon E, and um, this like is a- a garage door open. <laughs> no, yeah. that's not what it is. It's a hand heater. How this works, there's aluminum pads on both sides, as you can see, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a conductive heating system in the middle. It starts to emit heat out to both sides if you want it. You can control it. I mean, there's a little light device for you, right? Oh, wow. And um, it lights up or flashes. And also there's buttons on the side where you can control it. Now, I'm gonna push it. It lit, it lit up the C, and what that means is you can charge it with your, you can charge your cell phone with this little device. Ah. Now, if you push it again, it goes to T1. That means just the front side is heating up. You push it again to T2, that means both sides are heating up. Well, that's great. I think this is sort of a must have, especially if you're going skiing or for those people who enjoy winter or hiking. Right, right. If you ever find yourself in a jam, if your phone's out of batteries, you can charge it. And with this handy little flashlight, you can even use it as a beacon, a call for help if you're in a um, tough situation. Exactly. And it it reaches up to 55 degrees, which is more than enough to heat up your hands. All right, this is perfect. I mm -hmm. think I'm keeping this. No, hey, hey, can't do Put this in my pocket that. right now. <laughs> okay, um, what's our last item for today? I want you to actually feel your coffee. Okay. Because for our viewers out there, we put this out hours before the show, and it should be cold by now. The studio gets a little bit chilly. It's still hot. It is very hot. And that's because of what we call here our hot top. Now, this is unplugged, but let me show you how it works. There are two key components to this. There's, of course, this little gripping pad, and this helps in really gripping your cup, making sure that all the heat is transferred from the heating plate right here. So you put the gripping pad on, nice and tight, put your cup on there, and your cup is sure to stay warm because this keeps a heat of 60 degrees. So let's say I put in cold water into our cup, then our cold water would heat up as well. well. It looks like we can use this on our desk over there <laughs> or in our offices. Sounds great, but you know, I'm really impressed with the heater. This thing is working very well. Of course, if you're spending any time outdoors, then you can use this anytime you want. So we introduced you some of the uh, personal items, personal heating devices that you can, you can use during the cold winter months this time around. Angela, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Well, a nice glove can certainly keep you warm this winter, but the Golden Glove isn't something you can wear. As we kick things off with Tuesday's KBO Golden Glove Awards. Now, a lot of the winners this year weren't so surprising, including Kang Min Ho of the Lotte Giants, who won the catcher's category, and Park Byung Ho, who received over 96% of the vote. But for a couple of LG Twins players, it was a day to remember. Now, first off, over on the designated hitter category, Lee byung becomes the oldest winner at 38 years, 6 months, and 15 days as he wins his sixth Golden Glove Award. Despite his age, he has been one of the best hitters in the league. Meanwhile, Park yong tae the center fielder for the LG Twins, won the outfield category as he got very emotional up on stage after winning his third Golden Glove Award. 
Now, another voting results were out, and this time it was over in the Korean Basketball League, where the 2013 KBL All-Star ballot results were revealed. And once again, it was Ulsan Mobis Phoebus point guard Yang dong who received the most votes this year after getting 46,885 votes. It's the second time in three years that the point guard received the most All-Star votes. Meanwhile, the second and third most All-Star votes went to two rookies this season, Kim Min-gu of Chunju KCC Aegis and Kim Jong-yu of Changwon LG Sakers have been seeing great success in their first year in the league. Now, the All-Star game will take place on December 22nd in Seoul. And speaking of the KBL, on Tuesday, the Incheon Itilan Elephants were able to beat the Seoul Samsung Thunders 78-76 thanks to a buzzer beater from Chabawi. And so with that said, finishing things off with some Tuesday night's V-League action, the Samsung Wajit Blue Fangs took on Rush and Cash Vespid. So let's take a look at the highlights from Tejun. Of course, going into the game here, surprisingly a close game all around as Rush and Cash manages to keep up with the Samsung offense from the get-go. But Samsung still managed to take the first two sets, 25-22 and 25-23. But the third set, Arpet Baroti leading the way for the Vespid as Rush and Cash forced a fourth set, 27-25. However, that looked to be all for the expansion team as Samsung dominates the fourth set 25-14 as they take this game. Three sets to one. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. So the heavy snow warning has been lifted in Seoul and in the Gyeonggi-do area, but it had snowed earlier today. So let's get a check on the outside conditions with our Yi Dami, who joins us from Gwanghamun. Back to you, Dami. I'm back reporting live from Chungnogu's Hollow. Uh, right now, conditions are very cold. There are signs of sharp gale winds that are blowing our way. Uh, now, um, yes, here in Seoul, the preliminary heavy snow warnings have been lifted. However, there are still uh, heavy snow warnings uh, being issued over in Gyeonggi-do, also Gangwon-do, Chungcheong-buk-do, and Chungcheong-nam-do. Uh, with your morning commute, getting a head start for the day might be a good idea as the roads and the walking paths are quite slippery, so make sure to take it nice and easy. Also, make it nice and slow. Um, now, also for the temperatures right now, it is zero degrees Celsius. Later, our highs won't be that far off at one degree. Uh, with the sharp winds blowing our way, our body temperatures are going to feel much much colder, so make sure to bundle yourselves up from head to toe. Another heads up is tomorrow we will be expecting another round of nationwide snow starting here in the central regions, so prepare yourselves for that. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather for the rest of the peninsula. Daejeon's highs will only reach up to 4, Daegu, Gangneung and Gwangju at 5, Busan at 8 and Jeju Island at 9 degrees. That's all I have for your weather forecast. I'm Idami, Korea Today. All right, uh, we're going to check out a place that's actually known as a common hangout for the elderly and also middle-aged people. I have a feeling that I'm going to be over there <laughs> right, in the right, near about future. About 10 years' time. <laughs> in the near future, let's say. All right, joining us is Peter Bint. Good, good morning, morning yes, Peter. Good morning. You and I will go. Yeah, me not yet, young. <laughs> you can go check it out for a few years. But today, yeah, I'm going to bring you to a place known as the Tongmyo Shrine, which has been part of the city's culture for about 400 years. And near to the shrine, there's also the Tongmyo Flea Market, and that's the place that has become known as the uh, Hongdae district or the hip area for elder people. And many of the stores have maintained their, uh, their nostalgic ambience throughout the years. So why don't we check out the unique attractions around the shrine? 
In the center of Seoul lies the shrine to honor the famous Chinese military commander, Quan Wu, who is famously celebrated in the historical novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms. In 1600, the spirit of Quan Wu is said to have helped the Koreans defeat the Japanese invasion during the Imjin War, and the shrine was erected as a token of this. Right outside of Tongmyo, you're greeted by an amusing scene. It's the Tongmyo Flea Market, where you can have some fun digging through piles of clothes, just like you're on a treasure hunt. Well, they're shopping. <laughs> That's shopping, right? Yes. <laughs> a flea market. And the most popular goods at the moment are winter clothes to gear up for the cold. Tongmyo Flea Market offers goods at the cheapest price in Korea. Because everything costs between two to five dollars, you can buy an entire outfit from head to toe with only ten dollars. Come visit the cheapest market. And he's dressed like a high schooler. It's probably an original. Yeah, back in the days. <laughs> and with these cheap prices, you can attract many from penniless students to the elder regulars in the area. They are immensely popular. Everything is so cheap, I can enjoy my time without feeling burdened, and shopping helps me relieve stress. On an average weekday, there are about 300 stalls, and on weekends, about 600 open shop, selling all sorts of things like clothes, antiques, home appliances, and more. And as you would expect from a flea market, everything is here. Walking to the subway, I can see the market from the street. That's how I knew. Yeah. So we come here to do some shopping today. And Deeper in. <laughs> and in the alleyway, you'll also find some old stores that are a testament to Dongmyo's long history. This barber shop boasts a 30-year tradition in Dongmyo. And since it's near the flea market, it has great accessibility, so many customers regularly seek this barber shop even today. I came to Dongmyo on the bus or train all the way from Pochang, Gyeonggi-do. I'm here to look around the flea market and visit the barbershop, so I'm killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> and this is Dongmyo's cultural hotspot, a used record store. Now those are some rarities right there. Yeah, it's quite a small store, about 33 square meters, but there are about 20,000 vinyls. From Korean oldies to pop, jazz and classical music, it's like an LP record museum. Vinyl records produce fuller sounds and owning it just gives me so much joy. Also, since it's located within the flea market, I enjoy the old traces left behind my people. <laughs> Oh, they play the mm. song too. Exactly. You can listen to it on the spot after carefully selecting your vinyl. And many come here to buy records, but it's also a great spot to just enjoy the music. The owner is surprisingly young. Huh. And if you start getting hungry, you can seek out this restaurant. Prices this low are nowhere to be found. Wow. No. <laughs> no way. Wow. It's like $1.90. Wow. And the store is already crowded with people ready to eat. And since it's opening in 1990, the restaurant has raised prices only about a dollar on its menu during 21 years of business. <laughs> we operate a self-service restaurant. So in order to call up the right customers to get their orders, we use a microphone. At those prices, if you ask them to bring it to you, then I think you'd get kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> so they save labor costs so that more people could enjoy the low price, and it's a sign of Tongmyo's warmth and generosity and affection towards its visitors. And it looks so tasty. <laughs> All right. Okay. You know, I was looking at the flea market, and it just looks fabulous. A lot of people get together. But when you look at flea markets, I always wonder, 
How did this materialize? Where does it come from? How did it all start? Well, since about 30 years ago, the biggest flea market in Seoul was actually at Hwangak-dong. And uh, unfortunately, that had to relocate when there was the renovation project of Cheonggyecheon Stream in 2004. So the merchants, they kind of split up into two groups. Uh, one that went to the Seoul folk flea market mm -hmm. and the others went to Dongmo flea market. Ah. And it's grown in size and stature and become really successful. Okay. Mm. Young, the first thing that comes into my mind is how is it possible that these clothes are so cheap? I know, oh, that's I know. True. It's, it's unbelievable. And most of these clothes are actually really high quality merchandise. They're not like cheap uh, things that are exactly. going to get look holes fine. in or anything like that. Um, because most of them are actually stored for export uh, from trade companies. And then the best ones are picked out from there, sold at the Tongmyo flea market. So merchants can easily sell them at cost. And uh, the best thing is they have flash shelves, 10 items for $10. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Ten it's, like it's amazing. It's, that's really hard to <laughs> believe. Amazing. Now that is a steal. Yes. <laughs> we need to go this weekend. <laughs> and take the kids with you. You can learn a bit of history there too. Yeah, and haggle great. as well. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for this story. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the end of this edition of Korea Today. Okay, although the snow has stopped falling, the morning commute is still going to be rough. Right, you might really want to consider... Roads are slippery. That's right. You might want to consider um, public transportation. And... Uh, have fun going out to work. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning <laughs> at 7. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.